Welcome back friends, how are we doing? Yeah, so I got banned on YouTube for a week It was something to do with an old video of mine From, I don't know, three, four years ago Back in the days when I first started putting out my videos on YouTube anyway They got a hold of one of my videos And decided that it didn't abide by the community guidelines so they took down my video and slapped me on the wrist and said I can't post, I can't live stream, I can't publish anything for a week. And so here we are. I wanted to talk about this event. So the Abrahamic House or the Abraham House in the United Arab Emirates that you've heard me talk about. Well it opened up yesterday i'm saying yesterday because by the time i post this it will be the 2nd of march interestingly a lot of people have been i'm talking about in prophecy land there have been some channels that are you know worried about the one world religion and what have you so i think it's worth me talking about you know just to give you assurance as to i'm aware of what's happening and what do I think about it? Well, let's take a look at some of the things that I've got prepared to show you today. <laughs> and it looks like we might be here a while. I've got something I think is shocking. I came across this and I was like, oh my goodness gracious, wow. And I can't find anything about it anywhere else. So I don't know if anybody else has noticed it. But I saw it immediately and I want to share it with you. <laughs> Just stay with me, okay? What the opening of the Abrahamic Family House Synagogue in the UAE means for the Jewish community and the rest of the world. Well, what do you think it means, friends? Give me your feedback. Come on, saints of the Most High God. What does your wisdom, your discernment tell you about what you think this means? It can't be anything good, can it? You know, on both sides of the fence, we've got the Christians and some Muslims who are actually really opposed to this unification of three faiths worshipping in the same location, albeit separately, a bit too cosy for comfort. With great expectations, the Abrahamic family house, a mosque, a church, a synagogue, all sharing a multi-faith campus in Abu Dhabi, the capital of the United Arab Emirates, is about to make its world debut, opening its doors to the general public on March the 1st. You can check it out, it's all over the internet. This inspiring development, which is named after Abraham, the father of faith according to the Bible, the forefather of the three monotheistic religions, are just, oh, so cringeworthy when they say that Judaism, Christianity and Islam and if you can tell one of them is the um, uh, absurper the one who comes to destroy the inheritance of Israel is dedicated to the pursuit of peaceful coexistence for generations to come part of that complex is named after Moses ben Mammon or Rambam I'm going to come to that in a moment. They named it after him. Inaugurated on February 16 in the series of intimate and public gatherings. In fact, let me let me show you some of the clips. I've got a couple of video clips. Just in case you're new and you don't know what on earth is going on. What is this talk? It looks like this over here. So you've got these three structures. Very futuristic, very minimal sort of, I don't know, architecture. One is a church, a Catholic church. One is a mosque and one is um, a synagogue. And so they're all very, very similar. And you know another thing I noticed? They're all cubes. Here we go again, eh? The cubes is back. What's the fascination with the cubes? You remember in my last video I spoke to you about the New Jerusalem, friends, and what it would look like when it comes down. Do I have a... Let me see if I've got a graphic. Let me see. 
I spoke about this, didn't I, in my last video, about the New Jerusalem, how how big it would be if it was to be in our earth today. The size is huge. In its, according to some artist renditioning, it's actually a cube shape, the New Jerusalem. Fascinating, very interesting. So we've got this peculiar collection of buildings together. And they call themselves the Abrahamic Family House. I've actually got a playlist on this, but I haven't spoken on it for some time. I was waiting for this moment until it actually launched. I wanted to actually see if it would indeed go ahead. And here we are, 2023, and they've launched it. It's actually opened now. So, what do you make of this, friends? And probably the reason why you're here listening is to find out what do I think of it I don't think it's anything good at all I think it's in one word an abomination what the opening of the Abrahamic family house synagogue in the UAE means for the Jewish community and the rest of the world to me this seems like another attempt at appeasement it's not a one world religion coming together equally on a level playing field I see it as these are the two religions appeasing one inside the UAE this is an actual document from 2019 this is what it's based upon a document on human fraternity for world peace and living together faith um, it's a it's interfaith initiative is what it is now I know people are concerned and they're worried that this is a one world religion <clears throat> I disagree and I spoke about why I disagree in my previous videos a one world religion would consist of one God and all religions calling upon that one God this is entirely different what is happening here is three different prominent Abrahamic faiths let's say as they coin that term, is them coming together, the prominent leaders of that community, that faith community, respective of Judaism, Christianity and Islam, coming forward and saying, look, we want to work and get along together. The world is being torn up by extremism. What can we do to represent and do some good in this world? We just want to get along, blah, blah, blah. So they form this human fraternity because as well as Saudi Arabia and the Arabian Peninsula, Abu Dhabi, this modern futuristic infrastructure that they're building for the future, very modern, is all a part of modernizing the face of Islam across the world because they want to attract business. It's about wealth and it's also about a lot of damage control, to be honest, all the damage that has been done across the Islamic world, ISIS, the Taliban and the various jihadist extremist movements, Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran for example. So the Arabs in the south want to work together with the Jews, with the Christians and say look we don't want none, none, of, none of that, we don't want no part of it, we are here, we want to work together, blah blah blah. We want to represent what they feel is the majority of their faith, um, followers of their faith. So they've got this elaborate document. Now this is what's interesting, <clears throat> generically in the name of God. In the name of God who's created all human beings equal in rights due to his dignity, who has called them to live together as brothers and sisters. Okay. In the name of innocent human life that God has forbidden to kill. So they're saying... <clears throat> We've got more in common than we have differences, right? I will attach this in the description if you're interested. I just have to be mindful of doing that afterward. I've gone through this document before many times. They're talking about working together, let's say, this bit here. Moreover, 
let me take off the blue because it's actually harder to read. Moreover, we resolutely declare that religions must never incite war, hateful attitudes, hostility and extremism, nor must they incite violence or the shedding of blood. Well, who is actually doing it majority of the time? You see, we can't categorically say religions must never incite war, hateful attitudes, because there's only one particular system that is actually doing that today. And this is what irritates me about these initiatives, these interfaith um, dialogues, because they're not actually being honest. We're not actually coming to the table and calling a spade a spade. It's just all this flowery language. Anyway, these tragic realities are the consequence of a deviation from religious teachings. But again, the problem with that is the closer you examine the religious teachings of Islam, you find out that a lot of what these extremists do is influenced by those teachings. The very example that the Prophet Islam set forth to be emulated, to be copied. He set the example. So we've got this appeasement. And like I said in my other video, the older ones I did, when I first spoke about this, you'll have to go back in my history section, friends, in my playlist. Three, four years ago, when I first came on YouTube, I spoke about this because this was going on then. There was all this talk about this. And I said, this is not a one world religion. This is world religions appeasing one religion. There's a difference. I don't know if it's worth going through these articles. So this is from the US. It's jewishinsider.com. In today's daily kickoff, we report on a new bipartisan push by Republic Republicans Richie Torres and Mike Lawler to create a State Department ambassador position to advance the Abraham Accord. So the US is still adamant that this has got to be a good thing for the region. The Abraham Accords, you guys, this is it. This is the peace of the century, yes? So they're still adamant that we have to further this. We've got to get more nations involved. Saudi Arabia being the prime nation. But of course, there's all this trouble kicking off now, isn't there? In, um, where's my news link? There's all this trouble kicking off in Israel right now. US condemns Israel, far-right minister's call for Palestinian town to be erased. So there's this right-wing movement in Israel that is really sort of rocking the boat and so the world leaders are anxiously watching on as to is this going to incite the third intifada and of course it's headed in that direction so you've got them pushing for the abraham accords because they think that is the peace deal of the century but then you consider well what is actually going on in the region what is it the people the arabs themselves Envision for the future, working alongside Israel, working alongside with the Jews, with the Christians. What they're developing. This is a facelift. With an underlying, I mean, just look at this. I mean, does that not look like a serpent to you? <laughs> My goodness, you guys. The same architects that designed those buildings these things have been building and constructing new architectural wonders in the region let me go back to that website Sadiat island culture district the safti architect so there's this weird serpent looking thing you see the cross there yes over here so these are other buildings constructed with an underlying concept of diversity within unity the project brings together a mosque a synagogue a church within a shared public spark you see this is just history repeating itself friends 
Do you remember I spoke to you about the Pact of Omar when during the time of the Khilafah, the Caliphates, the Islamic Caliphates that took over the region, took over Jerusalem, there were certain peace treaties that were put into place. This is just a modern rendition of that. If you have eyes to see, this will make sense to you. The design of each religion's unique and specific worship space evokes the history, traditions and rituals of the particular religion. Seen together, they form an integrated and unified whole. Here you go. And I mean, oh my God, just look at that. What on earth? What on earth is this supposed to represent? If not a serpent. <clears throat> a coiled serpent. Each of these three worship halls is conceived as a variation of the sphere. So not a cube, we're now moving on to the sphere. Considered a sacred form, the sphere symbolizes oneness and the equity before God of all who worship. Its variants, the dome and the circle, are reoccurring symbols in the sacred buildings of all Abrahamic religions. So there's this effort <clears throat> to welcome and embrace Judaism and Christianity in the sense that in the Arab or the Arabian Peninsula they can be seen as though to be working alongside with one another bringing enlightenment to the rest of the world, right? <clears throat> the master plan is organised with its major public entrance and services on the south the mosque, synagogue, and church are entered off a common plaza, which abuts the principal gateway. Oh my goodness gracious. The public, arriving for worship and festivities at different times, that will sometimes coincide and mingle in the entry piazza. So this is how they envision it. Right? <laughs> in their dreamland. Nightmare situation if you think about it spiritually i'm saying the mosque is placed on the axis of mecca toward the west the synagogue on the axis facing jerusalem the church with a more flexible tradition of orientation faces the north as the public faces as the public arrives they face the visitor center which is oh well whatever whatever another picture my goodness you guys Wow, <clears throat> there's more to share with you. The US Department of State have this document, June the 2nd, 2022, last year, and it talks about <clears throat> religious freedoms in the UAE, the very place where these initiatives are happening. And there is no religious freedom, really. As long as you don't try to convert Muslims to Christ, we can get along just fine. Okay? So there's not equal religious freedom. I mean, how are people just... I don't understand. <clears throat> the law prohibits blasphemy and proselytizing by non-Muslims. An anti discrimination law includes prohibitions on religious discrimination and criminalizes acts the government interprets as provoking religious hatred or insulting religions but the government of the uae having designated the muslim brotherhood as a terrorist organization because the muslim brotherhood that i've also spoken about a lot in the past before is a threat to the princes and the kings, this whole Arabian monarchy system, They're, they are a threat to it. And this goes back to the infighting within Islam. And like I also say, I believe the book of Daniel has spoken about this in the book of Daniel chapter 11. The kings of the north and the south continued on into the Islamic empire, from the Greek to the Islamic <clears throat> you'll have to check my playlist out you guys i have a catalog of information it's just been building up over time the playlist would be daniel and the caliphates that's the name of the playlist so the uau designated the muslim brother terrorist organization 
In September, designated four members of Al-Islah, a Muslim Brotherhood affiliate, as terrorists, despite changes to federal laws removing penalties for adultery or consensual extramarital sex in August, the Supreme Federal Court rejected the appeal of a woman from Sharjah convicted of consensual extramarital sex, finding that local prohibitions were still applicable even in the absence of any federal penalty. It was because of Sharia, quite simply. In May, the Public Prosecutor's Office released a video on social media highlighting the penalties of acts of witchcraft and sorcery. There's a lot of reading I have to get through today. <clears throat> In September, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints <clears throat> began consultations for official recognition from the Dubai, Dubai Community Development Authority because they don't allow them equal rights at the heart of it, you see? So all these initiatives are just on the exterior. It looks good to the world. So this is an appeasement of Islam. It's not a one world religion. It's world religions appeasing one. So they applied <clears throat> to the authority in anticipation of building a temple in Dubai on government-granted land at what will be the former site of the Expo 2020. In February, the Dubai CD CDA granted an official license to the Jewish congregation, Gates of the East, making it the first and only Jewish congregation with CDA recognition. And that's telling me that this Jewish congregation has appeased the Sharia law in order to be accepted because they've got certain laws, Sharia laws that they have to abide by, meaning you can't be actively preaching your religion in the Muslim country. <clears throat> You've got to do it in your own churches, your own places of worship. I'm going to move on because there's too much to read. If you're interested, look, I can put these in the description afterward. Catholic leaders open new church in UAE's interfaith Abrahamic family house. So these people are very excited, you know. They're all excited about, oh, look what's happening here. St. Francis of Assisi Church, a synagogue and mosque, make up the new interfaith Abrahamic family house in Abu Dhabi. I'm going to move on to show you the videos. <clears throat> these are the two primary people who got together the pope and the islamic scholar not scholar rather sheikh al tayyib from egypt he's actually the grand sheikh of al azhar university the world the islamic world's number one university religious and jurisprudence so they learned the sharia to the t at this university and it's in egypt so he heads this. So this isn't just some insignificant, random person from the Islamic world who came together and signed this human fraternity document with the Pope. No, he's very prominent in influence. But there's this talk. They're fighting back now. They're actually countering the arguments or the attacks that many people, especially the Christian community, are saying that this is abhorrent, this is an abomination. And so they put out a statement. The Abrahamic family house is not about merging faiths. <clears throat> the purpose... Excuse me, the purpose is to advance interfaith dialogue and coexistence. You see? So in their world, this is all it's about. It's not about merging faiths. Islam will never, uh, I've said this before, Islam will never merge faith with anyone. It wants the superior prominent position. It wants to be at the number one position. Never is it going to lower itself which what it looks like is happening here, in order to have an interfaith dialogue. No, this is why this building, this construction is actually in Arabia. So it's in the position of power. 
a little bit of this article. I'm going to read it to you. For decades, the East and the Arab world in particular have been portrayed in Western media as regions plagued by religious intolerance and persecution. However, so just bear with me as we read this. I want you to see all sides, all perspectives, because then we get a bigger picture, right? So, he writes, However, religions are certainly not the main cause of this negative image, as much as political agendas were. Ever since the conflict over power of the Middle East arose between rival empires, these forces exploited religion to push their political projects. Neither religions nor their sacred texts sowed the seeds of such conflict or fueled it. Um, that's not true. That's not true. When we talk about Jerusalem, for example, let's go to the very heart of it. If it wasn't for the Islamic world's claim on Jerusalem that they want to liberate it from the east, um, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, meaning free of its Jewish citizens, which is calling for a genocide. If it wasn't for the Islamic claim over Jerusalem, there would be peace in the region today. But you see, this conflict is fueled and rooted in religion. This is a religious, a spiritual conflict. It's not political. The, polit the political side of it is just a vehicle in order to further the agenda. Does that make sense? So this talk is just flowery language. This is flowery language. There is clear historical evidence that supports religions because either, put it this way, this is either wishful thinking or this is very cunningly being deceptive. This article or this perspective, let's say. Look, we just want to get along. The conflicts, the religious, I mean, just think of the wording, that the religious conflicts are not religious at the root of it when they are. This is either wishful thinking or this is cunningly being deceptive. There is clear historical evidence that supports religion's innocence in this as there were many places where tolerance and coexistence between religious prevailed. What is he alluding to? I put to you that what he's alluding to here is back in centuries times past when the Islamic Caliphate ruled the Middle East. There was a pact that was put in place with the Jews and the Christians, also called as the people of the book, were under subjugation. They were allowed freedoms, they were allowed certain security, property rights, etc. But it came at a price, and that price was being subjugated and paying a second class citizen tax. So, what we're seeing today is exactly the same thing. Nothing has changed. So he writes on. One moment. I'm very glad to have this wonderful mic that has the mute button on there. <laughs> I'm so tired, friends. I'm absolutely exhausted. Please pray for me. Pray for my energy. Based on such a call. Hold on. I skipped it. I think this is important that I elaborate. From this standpoint, the call for human fraternities emerged from Abu Dhabi, where the document on human fraternity was co-signed. Where did it come from? People want to point fingers at the Pope. It emerged from the Islamic world. In 2019, by two great religious figures, Pope Francis, because they need the Pope, because in the Islamic world, you've got to understand this, my friends, in the Islamic world, the Pope represents the Vicar of Christ. It doesn't matter what you think right now, because according to their mindset, this is how... We are perceived, the Christian world. He's the Pope, he speaks for Christendom, and nothing's changed. So they need him to be signatory to this fraternity document. Because that proves to them that Islam has prevailed and we have their Pope under our subjugation. 
Does this make sense to you? And I'm telling you now, I'm probably the only one that's telling you this because the majority of people are so concerned about this being a one world religion. We are not headed in the one world religion direction, are we? If you read the word of God and if you've been following my messages that I speak about with the what the prophets speak of, especially the book of Revelation, this is not a one world religion coming. This is one person, one individual having dominion over certain regions, having 10 leaders join him and subjugating the Jews and the Christians. The dragon goes after the woman and her offspring. This is not a one world religion that the Bible prophesies, friends. So all this that's happening here is very prophetic. This is the harlot system. You see, this is why I say Mystery Babylon, the harlot, it's more intricate. There's more details to it. And it's all hinged on Islam, I can, if I can put it that way. It's hard to narrow it down. But if I can just say Islam is the system that fuels the beast, that has created the beast, and the beast that she's created will turn on her. The call for human fraternity is a purely humanitarian one. It's only humanitarian one, you guys. Oh, the world's humanism makes you just sick. Without any ideological orientations or political calculations and is addressed to all humanity, believers and non-believers alike. This is what they're saying. Now, in response to this global initiative promoting fraternity and coexistence, here we go. He's still with me. I've got a lot more to get through. Wait till I show you what I need to show you. Just stay with me. F please, friends. Please promise. Stay with me until I get there. A false disparaging narrative has recently emerged claiming that there are attempts to create a new religion dubbed the Abrahamic religion. So he's challenging this. He's saying it's a load of nonsense. Those who promote such ill-intended and groundless thoughts try to associate this. By the way, by the way, this isn't just Christians saying this. It's Muslims too. You just got to read the comments. You have to be aware of public opinion when it comes to this subject matter. All the articles, all the videos that are out there on social media, in the discussion sections, read the comments. Muslims and Christians alike are always saying, this is an abomination, we don't like it. So the writer is addressing both sides. So he's saying, those who promote such ill-intended and groundless thoughts try to associate this so-called effort to foster one religion with the Abrahamic Family House Initiative, currently under construction in Abu Dhabi under the guidance of the that human fraternity. The interfaith complex will host three separate houses of worship. So he's just reiterating. <clears throat> three separate houses of worship. Christian church, Islamic mosque and Jewish synagogue, as well as an educational centre unaffiliated with any specific religion. So it's a big museum. It's a big drama show. It's a museum, you guys. Some websites and social media in the Western and Arab worlds have taken aim at this noble project by falsely asserting that the initiative is an attempt to merge all the Abrahamic faiths and promote one world religion. So he's saying, yeah, I know, I've heard about it. This is ridiculous. This is not what we're doing. Some have even labelled our project. So he's a spokesperson for this human fraternity. Some have even labelled our project a chris Islam venture, an idiom blending the names of Christianity and Islam in a manner that denigrates both faiths. Well, if they call it that, well, they forgot about the Jews because this is including Judaism as well. This criticism cannot be further from the truth. The Abrahamic family house is a symbol of appreciation of religious diversity and unique character of each religion. It is not an effort to diminish religious differences or water down the uniqueness of each religion. In the complex, a visitor enters the area in which the houses of worship have been built to see three freestanding buildings which serve to remind humanity, and this is the whole point of what they're saying, that the Jews, Christians and Muslims can all sprout out of the same soil. The buildings are like three different trees 
in one forest. In one of my videos, I did a Bible study talking about what's required. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm so tired. I can't talk. According to the Bible, in fact, let's say, according to the New Testament, what is required in order to be grafted in, to be of the faith of Abraham, is Messiah, Jesus Christ, yes? Read the book of Galatians, it's very clear. So without this most important criteria, the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no such Abrahamic faith, simply put. That's the end of that. Some pictures. This is inside the mosque one. Interior of the mosque. Okay. Okay. This is the mosque building. So in the inside of all these three cubes, they're all different inside. That's outside of it. This would be the synagogue. The interior of the synagogue. This would be the interior of the church. And I don't know what on earth is going on here. Apparently, there's patterns and symbolism everywhere according to what they promote. So, anyhow, each house of worship will reflect the distinctive character of each respective religion. Blah, blah, blah. The Human Fraternity Project was previously subject to such accusations about starting a one-world religion amid the first stage of the COVID-19 pandemic. This was when it launched the Pray for Humanity campaign, calling on believers of all religions to join in a global prayer to ask God to end the pandemic, help those working in the medical community, la la la. The allegation at the time was that our call was to invent a prayer bringing Muslim, Christian, Jews, Buddhist, Hindus and other faith followers together to pave way for the new religion, subsuming them all. Despite these false allegations, on the day of the prayer, millions of people worldwide responded to the call positively. Each prayed according to their own beliefs, rituals, sacred texts and in their own languages. No common texts or rituals were provided, only the timing and purpose of the prayer. <clears throat> the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, that chap that signs the document with the Pope, recently answered critics when he said, those who falsely portray interfaith fraternity as mixing Judaism, Christianity and Islam into one Abrahamic religion are violating the most precious right humanity possesses, freedom of belief. So they're trying to put it to rest. Okay. <clears throat> now, one moment, please. <laughs> Not everybody agrees with the Pope, even in his own inner circle. In fact, I didn't even want to go into all of this because it kind of goes into another subject but it's impossible to talk about this subject without covering all bases and you know I like to be thorough. So I want to bring this up so I'll be as brief as I can. Some time ago, I mentioned it at the time it happened or soon after it anyway. <clears throat> Some time ago, some Catholics, bishops, archbishops, cardinals, who converted from Islam to Catholicism were very upset at Pope Francis and his response to Islam. So they got together and they, op they wrote an open letter giving Pope Francis an open rebuke. Yes. Islamic converts asked Pope in open letter to change his teaching on Islam. A new open letter to the Pope is making the round on the internet and it has gathered over 2.6 signatures, thousand signatures so far. You can find the document, it's online, you just got to type it in. Open letter to Pope Francis from uh, ex-Muslims. So the letter starts, Most Holy Father, it begins, Many of us have tried to contact you on many occasions and for several years and we have never received the slightest acknowledgement for our letters or request for meeting. The letter is not from the Dubia Cardinals or from more than the 800 signers of the 
Oh, so much to read. But from a group of Islamic converts to Catholicism who want Francis to answer a simple question, and this is their question. Why did they, the former Muslims, literally risk their lives to become Catholic if Islam is a good religion in itself, as the Pope seems to teach? Do you, do you understand? So within the Catholic leadership circles, the churches, the, the cardinals, what have you, they don't agree with Pope Francis and they don't like it one bit what he's doing. And they've made it very clear. So it was quite a scandal at the time when this letter was published. You may have heard about it. You may not have heard about it. But this is a very important document. And I'm going to, this is taken from 1peter5.com. And I'm going to attach this in the description for your further reading. I think it's important that you read it. I want to move on now. I want to show you the videos. Right, there we go. I've got three <clears throat> very short video clips I want to share with you now these are promotional videos Abrahamic family house this is not even one minute but just check out what's been shown here it might be very quick on the screen obviously it's under a minute but just for those of you who don't know you like visual aid I'm going to share this now let's just begin there okay creepy wasn't it the three cubes being held up obviously representing those three religious buildings now there's a, a short video i want to share with you it's from the national news it was six days ago and they're actually talking to one of the um i guess advocates for this movement the abrahamic house so i'm going to play it just have a listen <laughs> I'm Sarah Forster and welcome to this week's episode of A Closer Look. In this video, I came across something and I had to rewind and pause it. I was absolutely shocked. When I get to that point in the video, I'm going to pause it and I'm going to explain to you what I see. Okay? All right. This week, myself and a few colleagues came down to the Abrahamic family house. It's home to a church, a mosque and a synagogue. To find out more about these fascinating buildings, we're going to speak to our reporter, Saeed Saeed. So I'm back in the office now with our reporter, Saeed Saeed, who was down there with me at the Abrahamic Family House. Thank you for coming, Saeed. Pleasure to be here. So we're going to start with, I think, the, the main question, which some of our viewers might not know the answer to, which is, what are these three buildings doing so close together, so unified in their design, you know, all part of the one Abrahamic Family House kind of? Can you tell us why this build, these buildings even exist? Well, I think the key word there that you mentioned was family. Uh, this is a building, really, that you know that celebrates the shared values that the three Abrahamic faiths have. And by the three Abrahamic faiths, you're talking about um, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. So this is a building that shares, uh, that, that looks at and explores and celebrates the common things that we um, that these three uh, influential faiths have in the world today. And if you really look at this story, it might it might begin like this just happened. Um, just last week, but the story of the Abrahamic Family House really goes back to 2019. It was the year that was dubbed the year of tolerance by the UAE authorities, and within that time, what did we see? We've seen the historical visit of Pope Francis, you know, to the UAE. You know, we've seen um, a number of interfaith um, harmony, um, interfaith. Um, initiatives taking place. We've seen, um, you know, leaders of the Jewish faith coming to the UAE, the announcement of the synagogue. So all of this really is a story that began 
three years ago, and this is essentially, the, you know, the, um, the magnificent, you know, final product of these amazing and really historical discussions. Mm, yeah, it's it's definitely been in the works for a while. These buildings didn't just pop out of nowhere. But we were both there yesterday, and I'll tell you what I think my favourite bit was. But I just wanted to know what struck you the most being there because it's a very special place to be. It's not like you know anywhere else I've been here in the UAE. There's a real serenity to it. But like, what 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 aspect did you enjoy the most? What I what I was really what I was really struck by. I mean. I thought the first challenge was how do you blend, you know, the, these values um, aesthetically, culturally, in various ways within one building. And this is really, I feel, where the British <coughs> diamond and architect, Sir David Ajay, has done a brilliant job. What really struck me was how austere, was how minimal it is. This is a place for reflection. It is not, there's not a lot of so-called bells and whistles there um, from the you know from the end from the welcome center which is like a really elegant minimal space which also doubles up as an event center you know to hold conferences discussions and exhibitions to the garden which has over 200 plants locally sourced and it's just it's a lot of space it's a lot of silence and I think it's it's it, it, it really sets the right tone in, um, to go on this journey of reverence and the way that it's all linked together it's meant for you not to just go to the mosque to the church or to the synagogue It's meant for you to easily you know navigate between different faith and perhaps learn um, um, get glean some interesting insights along the way it is definitely a, an educational um uh, resource isn't it because like you say you don't just go to one it's for people to go visitors are welcome from the 1st of March which is Wednesday and visitors can go to each building and learn about it uh, it's free to go unless you want a tour which is which is paid um, and I would almost recommend the tour because when we went my favorite part was the detail the attention to detail as you go around it's not just that you know the the mosque it does face Mecca and the synagogue faces Jerusalem it's it's the reason why there are a certain amount of pillars, or it's the reason why this pillar is slightly higher than this pillar. You know, it's those atten those little details that I found really fascinating. So much thought went into the designs. And one thing that I found really fascinating was to see, so the church is predominantly a Catholic church, right? But obviously anyone of any denomination can go. But I don't know if you've been to a Catholic church before, but they are ornate. Like, that's the whole deal of the Catholic churches, is that... There you go. Do you see that? This slab. I'm assuming this would be where the bishop or the cardinal or the pope or the, the religious leader would stand behind the pulpit and read or pray but do you see this massive dent crack is split the rock is split like lots of paintings and carvings and everything so to see a catholic church this minimalistic i mean it's just opened up you guys and in fact they show it in another video as well the same where was it was it right there Yes, right there. Look at that, you guys. Huh. So this place is brand new. It's not even been one day. It's opened. And for some reason, the whole thing is broken. It's a crack. Unless this is a part of the... I don't know. Could it be the design? It doesn't look like it's, it's meant to be part of the design. It certainly doesn't blend in with everything else like churches is there's like lots of paintings and carvings and everything so to see a catholic church this minimalistic was really quite striking that's the same way that i felt also about the mosque it is also very minimal in design a lot i mean a key feature of mosques that i've seen really everywhere around the world is that it's defined by this 
you know, very ornate chandeliers, which serve a practical purpose, which is to light the prayer hall. But in the Abrahamic family house, there is no chandelier. Mm -hmm. Instead, what you have is really um, subtle but powerful spotlights up on the roof. And the roof also is quite curved, and that also allows the sound to reverberate much easier in the prayer hall. If you remember when we were going on that tour, um, our tour guide in the mosque spoke in such a slow voice, mm. and his and, it could, and the sound carried. Mm. And I and again, it, be, it is these things like this, just the, these removals, you know, of, of unnecessary, you know, things. Even the way that the, the books are, are 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 placed, just you know, elegantly within the walls, mm. it takes away any disturbances, any distractions, and that really will, you know, I feel I felt already this is a perfect place for contemplation and reflection. Mm. I mean, even the, he, he specifically mentioned, even the air conditioners are hidden. Like, you won't see the AC units. Um, and because it's, yet, as you say, it's just yet another distraction, right? Yeah, yeah and, even, and, even the, um, a lot of the, and even within the carpets, right, the, um, the lines that allows us, the people to stand in prayer together, mm. are engraved within the carpet in a mm. very subtle way. So there's no, so even the carpet, it, 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 it looks quite uniform. There's no like you know streaks, you know that that, that we see that, that, that we see a lot in other mosques as well. It's really it's really elegant. So I think we can agree that where the Abrahamic family house really stands out is detail, attention to detail. Like, and that's why you won't just pop down there for five minutes. You'll be there for a while, really kind of noticing all the special little parts. Um, I move on to the next video. You know, it reminds me of the scripture when it says that my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And they're just, it's just a, such an abomination. Another video and the same pulpit is shown and there's a massive crack in it. And it's only found in the Christian church, friends. Is that a sign? What do you think? <coughs> Non-Muslim with the respectful clothing can come into the mosque and enjoy while being quiet and uh, respectful to the visitor. And the same is for the synagogue and the church. All the all the doors are open. right there's something wrong with this that's been broken and the cross is on it and i just take that to me friends the way i see it is that god has already declared what he thinks about it by <laughs> by displaying the pulpit with a massive crevice in it the other video i had was just about this cultural district uh, you know i won't go ahead with that you can look them up if you want now let's move on to uh what i meant about this is appeasement back in the uh, olden days friends during the time of the islamic caliphates there was a certain peace in the region but it came by the pact of umar it was how the invading islamic armies came and they subjugated the peoples and they enforced a tax system this is how they were able to live coexistently together you see read along with me here 
So this is from historyofinformation.com, exploring the history of information media through timelines. Muslims occupied Jerusalem for almost 500 years, 451 years from 638 until 1099. Byzantine Jerusalem was conquered by the Arab armies of Umar ibn al-Khattab in 638. Among the first Muslims, it was referred to Medinat Bayat al maqdis the city of the temple jerusalem was known even then that this was the city of the temple the temple of the lord right a name restricted to the temple mount the rest of the city was called ilia reflecting the roman name given the city following the destruction in 70 a.d alia capitolina Later, the Temple Mount became known as Al-Haram Al-Sharif. I did a video um, and I was talking to you about the Knights Templars during the time of the Crusades. And yes, and I said in my video, I believe the Word of God in the Book of Daniel has spoken about this portion of history. The Knights Templars were very much involved in this area during that time. But I can't go into that because that leads me to more talking into other areas. And I want to keep this as on point as I possibly can. The Islamization of Jerusalem began in the first year or that's the Islamic first year or in the year 623. When Muslims were instructed to face the city while performing their daily prostrations. And according to Muslim religious tradition... Muhammad's night journey and ascension to heaven took place. Oh dear. You see, from the very beginning of Islam, Islam has laid claim of Jerusalem. This conflict, I mean, this whole conversation about three faiths coming together so we can live in harmony, peace and tolerance, it wouldn't even be a problem if it wasn't for Islam. I mean, the oxymoron of the whole thing is, is, is ironic, isn't it? After 13 years, the direction of prayer was changed to Mecca, because initially it was Jerusalem. In the year 638, the Islamic Caliphate... Oh, where did it go? How did it go there? I clicked on a hyperlink. The Islamic Caliphate extended its dominion to Jerusalem. With the Arab conquest, Jews were allowed back into the city. The Rashidun Caliph signed a treaty with the Christian Patriarch of Jerusalem, Sophronius, and I spoke about this some months ago, maybe two years ago, assuring him that Jerusalem's Christian holy places and population, so just bear this, bear this in mind when we are talking about the Abrahamic house. And what's the difference? There is none. This is still under subjugation. So the Pope has just gone over to Arabia, to Islam, let's say. Think of it that way. And subjugated the church, the Catholic church. But, you know, things are really that black and white, right? I break it down in that way to help us just see things differently for a moment. Pause and consider, huh, there's a pattern. There's some sort of theme going on here. The Rashidun Caliph signs a treaty with Christian Patriarch of Jerusalem, assuring him Jerusalem's Christian holy places and population would be protected under Muslim rule. An invading army, another kingdom comes and takes over. This is what they all do, right? But ever since this time, and even when we talk about the Ottoman Empire and when that ended, the Muslim world is still grieving the loss of the Caliphate. Because to them, in their mind, this region is still under their dominion. They have rights and it was taken away from them. So they want to rekindle those rights. They want to somehow reignite a revived form of caliphate. And I believe this is what the word of God talks about. The beast system and the harlot who are together. But yet they 
there is treachery between them both. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying, friends? Does that make sense? <clears throat> okay. Christian Arab tradition records that when led to pray at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, one of the holiest sites for Christians, the Caliph Umar refused to pray in the church so that Muslims would not request conversion of the church to a mosque. He prayed outside the church where the mosque of Umar stands to this day opposite the entrance of the church of the Holy Sepulchre. That's how close that church is, that mosque. According to the Golic Bishop Alkalf, who lived in Jerusalem, the mosque of Umar was a rectangular wooden structure built over ruins which could accommodate 3,000 worshippers. So there was this time, there was this season, there was a pact between the Christians and the Jews and the Muslims, the invading army, who came and took over and they ruled the region. But they had a pact in place. You be protected, we'll just get along as long as you are obeying the rules, right? When the Arab armies under Umar went to Beit al-Maqdus, they searched for the site of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the fatherest mosque, that was mentioned in the Quran Hadith according to Islamic beliefs. Contemporary Arabic and Hebrew sources say the site was full of rubbish and the Arabs and Jews cleaned it. The Umayyad Caliph Ab Abd al-Malik I usually say Abdul Malik, commissioned the construction of a shrine on the Temple Mount, now known as the Dome of the Rock. And the Knights Templars had a lot of connection with this place. A lot. This is why when we skip over these portions of history and then we read the Word of God, no wonder so much of it is like anomaly to us. Because there are things that are missing in our understanding. In the late 7th century, so two of the most city's most distinguished Arab citizens of the 10th century were Al-Muqadasi, the geographer Al-Dami and the physician. I want to move on to talking about why they named the synagogue after Rambam. I'll come to that. Let me just show you the pact. So I enlarged the text, as you can see. It's important that I have these words enlarged, even when I read the scriptures, because what's the point, friends, in me having all this text on the screen when it's so tiny? You can't even see it. So it's nice in big letters. Right. Islam and the Jews, the pact of Umar. <clears throat> is it possible that this is prophetically significant when we talk about a peace treaty? That's already been in, in effect, friends. You see, the Pact of Umar is the body of limitations and privileges entered into by treaty between conquering Muslims and conquered non-Muslims. We have no special treaty of this sort with the Jews, but we must assume that all conquered peoples, including the Jews, had to subscribe to it. Thus the law cited below and directed against churches apply to synagogues too. The pact was probably originated about 637 by Umar I after the conquest of Christian Syria and Palestine. By accretions from established practices and precedents, the pact was extended, yet despite these additions, the whole pact was ascribed to Umar. There are many variants of the text and s scholars deny that the text as it now stands could have come from the pen of Umar I, it is generally assumed that its present form dates from about the 9th century. The Pact of Umar has served to govern the relations between the Muslims and the people of the book, such as Jews, Christians and the like, down to the present day. This is what I'm getting at. What we're seeing today is just a continuation of what happened back then. You understand? You, get, you follow with me, friends? One world religion. All this hoo-ha drama. No, it's not one world religion. It's Christianity and Judaism saying, okay, Muslims, we'll, we'll, we want peace. We just want to work together with you. What can we do? Where do we need to sign? In addition to the conditions of the pact listed below, the Jews, like the Christians, paid a head tax in return for protection and for exemption from military service. Jews and Christians were also forbidden to hold government office. Huh. 
This pact, like much medieval legislation, was honoured more in the breach than in the observance. In general, though, the pact increased in stringency with the centuries. It just increased in stringency with the centuries and was still in force in the 20th century in lands such as Yemen. The pact was in Arabic and this is what it wrote. Or what it reads. I'm going to read it to you. So we understand what was in place, what took place, and how this is still, I believe, influencing a lot of these Islamic leaders and their mindset as to how do we move forward. We've had this pact, it was in place, let's just rekindle it. This is a writing to Umar from the Christians of such and such a city when you Muslims marched against us Christians, we asked of you protection for ourselves, our posterity, posterity, our possessions and our co-religionists and we made this stipulation with you that we were not directing our city or the suburbs any new monastery, church, cell or hermitage, that we will not repair any of such buildings that may fall into ruins or renew those that may be situated in the Muslim quarters of the town. Come off it, you guys. This stuff still happens today. It's still happening in Islamic nations. So if the people of the UAE really think they're enlightened and they really want to show the world a demonstration of interfaith and championing this movement that we can work together, we can get along, you don't fool me one bit. Not me. Absolutely not one bit. That we will not refuse the Muslims entry into our churches either by night or by day. That we will open the gates wide to passengers and travellers. This is a people who are subjugated, who are slaves, second class, third class citizens. That we will receive any Muslim traveller into our houses and give him food and lodging for three nights. That we will not harbour any spy in our churches or houses or conceal any enemy of the Muslims. At least six of these laws were taken over from earlier Christian laws against infidels. That we will not teach our children, so they're saying that this must have been taken from the Torah. It was that stringent, maybe. Maybe that's what they mean here, who knows. That we will not teach our children the Quran. Some nationalist Arabs feared the infidels would ridicule the Quran. Others did not want infidels even to learn the language. That is true even today. That we would not make a show of the Christian religion nor invite anyone to embrace it. That we would not prevent any of our kinsmen from embracing Islam if they so desire. That we will honour the Muslims to rise up in our assemblies when they wish to take their seats. So when they come in, the Christian will stand up. When they wish to take their seats, that we will not imitate them in our dress either in the cap, turban, sandals or parting of the hair, that we would not make use of the expressions of speech, nor adopt their surnames. So true today, even when I came to faith in the Lord Jesus, I was told to remove my father's name, because it's an Islamic name, I can't have it anymore. Well, as you can see, my YouTube channel still has my father's name on it. Awesome. It's a part of, you know, identity. You don't just change names because somebody says so. Infidels must not use greetings or special phrases employed only by Muslims. That we will not ride on saddles or gird on swords or take to ourselves arms or wear them or engrave Arabic inscriptions on our rings. That we will not sell wine forbidden to Muslims. That we will shave the front of our heads. That we will keep to our... You know, someone once said... There's a similarity between Islam and Nazism. What do you think about that? I feel for those Muslims, you know, that who don't know what system they're a part of. They're not fully aware. I feel for them. I feel for them so much because according to them, they're just worshipping God, doing the best they can. They don't understand all this hatred. They're upset that these radicals do what they do in the name of Islam and they don't want nothing to do with it. These people just want to worship God but are afraid. They have a lot of questions unanswered and they're not sure who to believe. I feel sorry for them. Pray for them, friends, that they will come to the light and the light is only found in Jesus Christ. Otherwise, they'll be forever groping in the darkness, 
Lord have mercy. So this is very pathetic, isn't it? It's a very pathetic, very sad, a depressing state. There's no enlightenment here. There's no equality. There's no tolerance. I mean, what is this? This is an expression of a subjugated people. That we will not display the cross upon our churches or display our crosses on our sacred books in the streets of the Muslims or in their marketplaces. You know what makes me think this is all true? Because it still happens today in Islamic countries. I mean, you don't have to go far. Just discover it yourself in Pakistan, for example. Where my family's from. <sighs> Look at this. So we will not display the cross upon our churches or display our crosses on our sacred books. And in the Islamic end times, the Islamic Jesus comes and he does two things, doesn't he? He breaks the cross and he kills the swine. Hmm. That we will not recite our services in a loud voice when a Muslim is present, that we will not carry palm branches on Palm Sunday, on our images in procession, in the streets, that at the burial of our dead we will not chant loudly or carry lighted candles in the streets. This is very sad. That we will not take any slaves that have already been in the possession of Muslims nor spy into their houses. All this we promise to observe, ob observe on behalf of ourselves and our co-religionists and receive protection from you in exchange and if we violate any of the conditions of this agreement then we forfeit your protection and you are at liberty to treat us as enemies and rebels. Source, Jacob Marcus, the Jew in the medieval world, a source book. Here's a video a website that I want to share with you. I've shared his um, videos before. This is Bill Warner. He's a professor and he's an expert on political Islam. Listen to what he has to say here. Are you still with me? Okay. I would like to introduce you to a new word. Dimi. D-H-I-M-M-I. A Demi is a person who has signed a contract, and the contract referred to here is the contract that the Jews of Kaibar signed. After Muhammad had cleansed Medina of Jews, he then attacked the Jews of Kaibar, a town nearby. After he crushed them, he then took their property and made a contract with them that from henceforth they would pay half of their income to Muhammad. This income, or this tax, was called the jizya. We've heard of the jizya recently because Islamic State has caused the Christians to pay the jizya in Iraq. Now this jizya is referred to in the Quran, 929. Fight against those Christians and Jews who do not follow the Sharia and who do not acknowledge Muhammad and the truth of the Quran until they are subdued, pay the jizya, and are humiliated. And this humiliation is a very important part of being a demi. The Treaty of Humiliation is the Treaty of Umar, in which it lays out all the things that a demi has to do. They have to obey Sharia law, they can't carry a sword, they can't ride a horse. If a Muslim shows up and they're sitting down, they stand up and give him a seat. They don't have civil rights, they can't testify in court, and on and on. So the demi is to be ground down and humiliated. When I was in the Balkans recently, I spoke with people who used to rem could remember the demi status of Christians in the Balkans, and they were all the things in the Treaty of Umar. I want to read for you a quote from an imam who really catches the essence of the demi and his consciousness. The demi is commanded to put his soul, good fortune, and desires to death. Above all, he should kill the love of life, leadership, and honor. The demi is to invert the longings of his soul. He is to load it down more heavily than it can bear until it is completely submissive. Thereafter, nothing will be unbearable for him. He will be indifferent to subjugation or might. All things are the same. The soul will be submissive and yield what it should give. Jihad puts the demi status in place, and then the demi is what supports Islam 
until finally all the demis are converted to Muslims. Because in the end, every demi finally ceases. It may be generations, but the demi finally disappears and goes away. So you need to understand that demi is a real term, and you probably already know some people who are a little bit demi. They're the ones who don't want to criticize Islam, because you see, the demi is forbidden from criticizing Islam. But you need to know what a demi is, and don't be one. That's right. Bill Warner, check his videos out. He has his own channel. Now, this video has ended up being a very long video. I want to get to this point. So the synagogue, let me turn my mic around. The synagogue in the Abrahamic house, you know, there's a church, there's a mosque, there's a synagogue. Well, they named the synagogue after him, Rambam. Rambam was a dhimmi. He was a Jew, but he lived in a time when the Islamic armies invaded. And the Jews were persecuted, Christians were killed, and the subjugation was, was bad, was intense. So I believe this dude was actually, I don't think anyone's ever called him a dhimmi. I might be the first person ever to call him a dhimmi. From what I know about him, he was a dhimmi. Moses, Memonides, a Sephardic Jew, was born in what is now Cordoba, Spain, to a distinguished family of Jewish scholars and judges. I mean, a lot of Jews know about him. I mean, he's revered, he's held in high esteem. His work is still, you know, quoted and talked about today, right? You must have heard about him as well. So, what part of this do I want to read with you? Because, you know, otherwise I'll end up reading the whole thing. Let's move down here. Um, Maimonide served as the official head of the Jews in Fustat, Old Cairo, and through his works and letters fundamentally influenced the development of Jewish law throughout the world. He apparently mastered all philosophical works that were available to him, including works by Plato, Aristotle, Al-Farabi, Avicenna and Avampes, and Strove, especially in his Guide of the Perplexed, his written word, his written work, to reconcile them with the religious law. Mammonides also served as a court physician to the Ayyubids in Egypt and was associated with Al-Qadi Al-Fadil, an important advisor to Saladin. So he's got this background, very familiar background, during the time of the Islamic invasions. Let's read this bit here. Mammonides' many accomplishments, I'm going to just say Rambam, so it just rolls off the tongue easier. <laughs> That's, that was his nickname, Rambam. His many accomplishments followed a rather turbulent childhood and early adulthood spent, spent moving eastward. I'm tired. That's why I'm not talking right. To avoid oppressive policies against Jews. Rambam left Cordoba, Spain around 1148 after invasion of the Alamads, another Islamic invading army, a North African Berber tribe that imposed an extremely strict version of Sharia law that included inquisitions and persecutions against Jews. It was an extremely strict version, you see. It wasn't just Islamic Sharia, no. That included inquisitions and persecutions against Jews, Christians and even Muslims. He spent the next 12 years in Spain, though it's not clear where, and apparently continued to receive religious, legal and literary education and possibly medical one as well. Around 1160, Rambam and his family lived in Fez in Morocco, possibly as outward Muslims, but crypto-Jews, where Rambam continued his medical and scientific studies. It's possible that he lived as a secret Jew, crypto-Jew, outwardly Muslim just to survive. I could do a whole video on just him alone. I might have to do that. But this place, Fez in Morocco,
And let me read one more snippet. <laughs> one article is not enough, isn't it? I have to get up more than one article. <sighs> he saw firsthand Islamic armies invading. He saw them persecute Jews and Christians. But for some reason, he still was able to thrive and be successful. I believe he became a dhimmi. He became subservient to the Muslims, his overlords. In 1150, when Rambam was only 15, an event occurred that not only had tremendous bearing on his life, but on all of Spanish Jewish history. The Muslims controlled Spain at the time and for the first 400 years that the Jews were there, they lived in peace and comfort because the Moors, the Muslims who ruled Spain, were moderate. They did not take Islam too literally. I just need to love these Western dhimmi websites, jewishhistory.org. <clears throat> but a sect of fundamentalist Muslims called the Amalads the devotees of Muhammad staged revolutions throughout Spain that overthrew the moderates and demanded a strict interpretation and enforcement of all the laws in the Quran. So he had to leave. He left his home. One of the first acts was to force the Jews of Cordoba in Spain to convert to Islam or leave behind their homes and businesses, essentially all their wealth. Many Jews were loath to give up their possessions and sought to ride out the storm by converting and remaining in Cordoba. You see? Going back to Fez in uh, Morocco. However, when they arrived in Fez, an al revolution broke out there too, so they escaped to the Atlas Mountains where they lived in a cave for 79 years. Rambam never recovered from the traumatic arrival of these Alomads. A portion of this is reflected in the personal animosity Rambam harbored toward Islam and the Quran. To a certain extent, he blamed the death of his parents and other personal tragedies, including the death of his first wife and children, beloved brother, his family, to to them he blamed them for it well of course naturally he was they were under terrorism they were being terrorized they were terrorized people that place called fez i won't bring that up there's too much more it's just going on into what what else took place during that time now another article about him is there you go there's a visual what he would have looked like where's my article on the fez <laughs> There we go, the Fez. You know the Shriners, friends, who wear that red hat? The Shriners? It's the Fez, isn't it? Well, there's an interesting story behind it. And soon after this, I'm going to go to the scriptures and we need to get into the word because I've got a scripture for this message today and I think it's perfect. Praise the Lord. He writes, this is an evangelical an evangelist's blog here it's got loads of articles if you're interested in reading but i wanted to get something that summarized it pretty simply fez the fez is one of the most recognizable symbols of shriners international and was adopted as the shriners official headgear in 1872 why was it called that the fez hat from the place of morocco the city fez the hat represented the Arabian theme the fraternity was founded on. It also serves an outward symbol of one's membership in the fraternity. Much like the white apron worn by Masons as a symbol on their brotherhood, the Fed is worn by the Shriners. Okay. The Fez was named after the city of Fez, Morocco. Well, as I continued my research, I found out that something happened in the city of Fez. Yes. After which this piece of headgear is named, one author whose father had been a high-ranking member of the lodge before leaving it due to his Christian conscience has explained the history of these things. The fez itself is an example of this double meaning behind most of Freemasonry's facade. Worn and even carried to the grave with pompous dignity, the history of the fez is barbaric and anti-Christian. The early 8th century, Muslim hordes overran the Moroccan city of Fez shouting... There is no God but Allah Muhammad is his prophet, which is exactly the counterfeit to the creed of the Christian faith, where we believe in the Father and the Father and the Son. This creed is exactly 
against the Father and the Son. They butchered approximately 50,000 Christians. These men, women and children were slain because of their faith in Christ, all in the name of Allah, the same demon God to whom every shriner must bow, with hands tied behind his back in worship. I did a video on this back in the days. It's called the Shriners. And I read what they read when they take their oaths and they make a promise to Mecca, to Gaba and to Allah and Muhammad. <clears throat> so this is where the word Fez for the hat came from, from this place in Morocco. After this bloody slaughter that happened apparently. So a legend has been passed down. I'm just connecting some dots and I'm sharing it with you. Remember that the Allah of Islam is not just another name for God. Allah is the name of another God. In usual occultic fashion, the initiate swears that he will be inseparably obligated to this most powerful and binding oath. <clears throat> These blood stained caps eventually were called fezes and became a badge of honor for those who killed a christian the shriners wear that same red fez today the greatest tragedy is that the fez is often worn by by men who profess to be christians themselves i just wanted to share that with you this is the scripture that came to mind when i thought of the abrahamic house these elaborate white stone buildings, the mosque, the synagogue, the church. And this was the first scripture that came to mind, friends. The very first one. Matthew chapter 23, Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and an all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. In fact, the whole gospel chapter, Matthew chapter 23, is the Lord Jesus rebuking the scribes, the self-righteous Pharisees. And if we read this, we can really summarize how the Lord feels toward this Abrahamic house, this Abrahamic initiative. This whole chapter, chapter 23, I read so much, I think at least I can read the word of God. Let's read it. <sighs> then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples saying, you know, the Lord was so angry at the religious crowd, the self-righteous, who were righteous on the exterior, but inside they were so wicked. He had a lot to say to them, didn't he? The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works. For they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay on them men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works do they do to be seen by men. He's saying how they make their clothes, those tassels, the, um, the borders on their dresses, broad and enlarged, the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts the best seats of the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Today, I see a lot of these muftis, these um, leaders in the Islamic world are the modern day Pharisees today. Exactly the same. These are the Pharisees today, you guys. But all their works do they do to be seen by men, right? But you do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one 
is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make, make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, Whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it. And the Lord just really gets to the heart of it. That they really have wickedness. It's all about the exterior, friends. This self-righteousness, which is to the Lord, filthy rags, right? He who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay the tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guide to strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse it outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion, self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so you... Oh, Lord, help me. Sustain me, Lord. I'm very tired. Let the word of the Lord sustain me. <clears throat> Even so you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypo hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you. Because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we have not been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Wow. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt, serpents, brood of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? What did the Lord say? Where are they going to go? And where will they not be able to escape from, friends? They're going to the pits of hell. You see how serious the Lord takes it. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, ye shall see me no more, till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Friends, the word of the Lord is clear, absolutely clear. You know, Jesus Christ is our rock. I'm trying to find that daft image where is it gone jesus christ is our rock the firm foundation yes is jesus christ but here there's another foundation that's been laid 
Whatever they are saying that their vision represents, we can see spiritually the abomination, the blasphemy. But is there something to worry about in terms of a one world religion? No. The beast system is coming from the north of Israel while the harlot has her claws in many places around the world and it's rooted in Islam, friends. Pray for the people who are living here. Pray for the Christians who have no discernment. None. They've got no discernment. I had a scripture up here from... <clears throat> Let's read both scriptures, one from 1 Thessalonians and the other one from 2 Thessalonians. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For ye you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, which is like the climate that we're living in right now, with these initiatives, you know, they're trying to reach this climax of peace. But there can be no peace without the Prince of Peace. He they don't want. He they reject. Then sudden destruction comes upon them as labour pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who after the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Hallelujah. You see, we have a hope in Christ Jesus. We have him to look forward to. We know he's there, he's with us. And he's coming back for us. He's our eternal hope. This is our helmet of hope. The hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath. But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Who died for us. That whether we wake or sleep. We should live together with him. Hallelujah. Therefore comfort each other. And edify one another. Just as you are also doing. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 1, Now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means. That day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exhorts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So we know there's so much more to come, but we see the signs, they're everywhere. And Paul goes on, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth everyone who gets sucked into believing it are not going to be among us friends they are among those who will perish because they don't love the truth that they might be saved and for this reason god will send them strong delusion at that point they accept the lie that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth which is Jesus, but I had pleasure in unrighteousness. So stand faith in your firm, friends. Stand firm in your faith. <laughs> in other words, I have more to talk about, but I'll have to come back another time. What's that final message? Oh, it, this is what's happening, friends. So we have the beast system and the harlot.
this is what we're seeing and i talk about both aspects in my videos i'm so sorry to show you such a ghastly image oh lord have mercy what days we are living in my goodness what else is going to come this year friends be prayerful be watchful i will be back again soon and in fact this week i've got a a movie documentary review to share with you i'm very excited to share that with you make sure you check that out um, in the meanwhile keep your eyes peeled and stay faithful friends don't let anything stay your faith or shake you up be faithful to the end i'll be back again soon lots of love jesus christ is lord